What's going on, everybody? I'm just going to get right into it because we have a uh, stellar. Apparently, also, I didn't even think about this. We have a backdoor Normandy FM episode um, where I'm the host for some reason and Normandy are my guests. But we have a great show for you tonight. We're going to do a little bonus episode talking about our travels in L.A. to Summer Game Fest. I got joining me, of course, the lovely Kenneth Shepard. Uh, Ken, you've both been on the show before, but mm-hmm. I think you've been on like wacky episodes i don't know if you've actually been on like a regular episode i think you've mostly just been on specials which is not a bad thing it's just i think i know ken was on for pokemon Ar- arceus yeah yeah yeah. and i think that, at one point we had like it. a i think at one point we had a like a 10 person post pax east like nonsensical mm. episode i don't know if you were there for that ken i think eric was but yeah yeah uh anyways kenneth shepherd ken hey how are you how are you doing today uh, you gave me a quick jump scare because I did not realize we were starting like oh, immediately. Yeah. So and then so like when you're when you're like welcome, I was like, yeah. oh shit, I got to. I know. <laughs> well, put no, on show face. Gotta put on that that side, that mask. Normally, it's like a nice easy walk in. It's like I'm me and Mike or whoever is just like talking about some bullshit completely unrelated to everything in the world. But we, we, this, that doesn't exist right now. We could have done that. We could have just did mm. that. But you know, we're we're here. Poe's chilling. Is Poe just like flat out asleep on your keyboard right now? What is happening? Not like asleep. Poe is just kind of hanging out, like belly up, just vibing. He wants attention. Every time I go away for long enough, which is usually like more than a day, uh, he becomes attention starved Mm. and needy. uh, And he will do this for upwards of three weeks. So uh, this is going to be really disappointing for him when I leave again at the end of june for a week just don't uh, he's going to be depressed yeah so i gave my cat depression i'm sorry mm, po uh ken for those who may not know who you are which if they don't I, fuck them but uh if they don't know who you are or you know whatever who's ken what's ken up to what's what's ken got going on uh i'm a staff writer at kisaku uh the co-host of normandy fm um that's that's me as far as the internet is concerned okay okay uh, you have any other SGF stuff out? I know you guys did. Uh, I don't know if it's out yet, but you did a Dragon Age mm-hmm. episode already. Yeah, yeah. We did. We did our, an episode on Dragon Age, and also had like a sort of catch-all for like here are other things that we saw in SGF. So okay, that's cool. a whole feature-length episode uh, up on the feed for you right now. Hell yeah! So go check that out. Uh, and then, of course, joining us as I alluded to many times already on this episode, uh, one Eric Van Allen. Eric, how are you doing? Hello, uh, I'm doing all right. You know, it's been kind of a weird re-entry to society after SGF because mm-hmm. I feel like, obviously, I fucked up my. We can say fuck, right? You fuck can say is okay. Whatever fuck, you fuck, want. Fuck, fuck. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so I fucked up my throat on the first night, which I told Ken if we did karaoke was going to happen. Mm-hmm. It was absolutely going to happen, and so even though I did this to myself and I have only myself to blame, I still do blame Ken. And uh, that's that's just how I, it goes. I don't I didn't tell you to put Rage Against the Machine on. That, well, that was on you. Sometimes you gotta let people know that there are those who work forces, and they're the same that burn crosses. You know, <laughs> it's, that's that's how it goes sometimes. But uh, and then you gotta say that you won't do what you tell them, or mm-hmm. they tell you, and then I won't do what they voice. tell me, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so, Is there uh, a, an, an all star from this this round of uh, karaoke? Was there someone that? that was like the owned the microphone oh i don't know i i I think a surprise one for many of us myself included because i knew it was coming up but i wasn't sure how it was going to go over with this group uh was we put up a a selena song i believe from uh Mm -hmm. from kate kate sanchez put that up and it was i always forget the name of the song but it's the Ay, 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 como me duele. Mm-hmm. And everyone was kind of getting into it and having fun with the call and response and stuff. And I oh, was like, yeah. you know, I'm glad that everybody had a good time with that one. So Th- uh, those are the best. When like when mm-hmm. everyone else in the room is getting involved, that's when you have a certified banger. Yes. Yeah, I have recently put the Pokemon theme song in my rotation, and that has that has become a new staple. How have we not done that before? How has I, that never occurred, got put on? That, that it one, occurred to me at Moises' birthday, and I have done it the last two times since. So. That one's ambitious, though, because that's a pretty high song. Like, like the registers are pretty up there, and mm-hmm. I try to, I try to keep it reasonable 
for you know how how high up in registers you go yeah. with mm. songs as the night goes on you don't always want to be like screaming your lungs out then again i put you know dog days are over on there too so mm-hmm. that was annoying, but mm-hmm. um that's actually kind of if you octave shift up and down it's a little bit more doable for most mm-hmm. people but uh not to get into music theory all the oh, time why not who cares I've, I've been trying to find more karaoke places that you shift the key up and down because like as a former chorus kid that like always is the thing that's in my brain is like i could do this song but i could do it better if i just brought it down a couple or moved it up a little bit and it's becoming a, a weird like it's one of those things where like I, I know i do it and then it probably annoys people that i'm like carrying that much but it's just like i would like to be comfortable singing a song i'm singing you know the the thing that bugs me about that because i agree with you and there are songs that definitely when i was doing like worship leading and stuff like that you would have to to keep mm. because like nobody's singing and like God, there was one that was in like i think it was b or b flat or something like that and i was like this is going to be a pain in the butt so take it down to a or something like that mm. but uh if I hear a popular song and I hear it in a specific key often enough, then like I will muscle memory want to default to that key. And it feels strange to try and force myself to sing it in a different key. Uh, Mm. I have that problem. I don't know why I don't know how to stop it. So I just, I stick with it and destroy my vocal cords in the process. So I spent all of SGF downing, one economy bag of cough drops. Now I'm in post (laughs) SGF with a second economy bag of cough drops. (laughs) <laughs> working on it um but we're we're getting better as you can mm-hmm. probably tell from my mm-hmm. voice i thought it was funny that uh so my sister watched the giant bomb segment that we were all on mm-hmm. and apparently one of the comments on the stream said wow eric's voice sounds different and that's a very <laughs> funny way for someone to figure out how uh losing your voice works but they <laughs> learned that night uh what that means so <laughs> i that segment has been very interesting for me personally uh if if, mm-hmm. no, if you're listening you know what we're talking about a bunch of us were on the giant bomb coach at sgf and part of that segment was us getting blown aside from ken and uh michael hyam getting blown in the face with an air uh air blower uh a leaf blower, mm-hmm. leaf blower. and dan Riker blew nine of us mm-hmm. live on air mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he blew mm-hmm. nine nasty boys um mm-hmm. yeah. well People... eight nasty boys and then and then, and then jeff grubb who participated we in the nastiness honorary title for that segment at least yeah i don't know if yeah, it carries yeah. over i don't know if his, his card works after that tangential nastiness yes yes uh like people who probably just don't even normally listen or watch the potty or anything like that they saw that clip because i had posted that clip like on instagram or whatever and people have been like what the fuck is going on in your life <laughs> like what what is that <laughs> what is going on uh, so, uh, thank you for that. If, if I'm known for anything now, it's for getting blown in the face for some reason. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I was trying to be, <laughs> uh, I still can't get over from that clip. Ken's like shuffle out of the way of like, not cl- like, even though it was a decided up front, like, Hey, Ken does not want to partake in this thing. Still just a shuffle out of the way in between Alex and Eric is, it kills me every time. It's, it's just a, it's such a good moment that whole that whole two minutes is very very well done mm. um mm. but eric what, what <laughs> aside from trying to save your your vocal cords how how have you mm. been post uh, post packs post sgf uh what do you got going on uh not much you know i'm over there at destructoid i did end up doing a few uh write-ups so i think i have one live already about metaphor mostly because i thought uh, yeah, a lot of people came out of that metaphor appointment talking about the the art and style of it, which obviously that was one thing. But I was really enamored with the uh, the approach to combat, which I thought was something that the Persona series, which metaphor is not a Persona game, but it's like it's it's a Persona game. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, it's something that I think the Persona series is needed for a while is like a, as something that makes the dungeon crawling feel a little bit more fresh and a little bit more uh, different, because I think otherwise that game would have felt like a fantasy skinned persona five mm-hmm. and the changes they made to the combat to being able to attack on the field and kind of have that system. And, and then the really cool um, attacking into the squad strike uh, to start turn-based combat. I thought that was a very, very smart decision. One that I think is going to be, uh, I don't know if they'll keep using it into persona six or anything like that, but I definitely think it's something that a lot of people are going to take notice of yeah. this game. Um, so I wrote that up. I have a few other ones that I might write up over the next week or so. Uh, the advantage of this is that, so I went under Axe of the Blood God, uh, and so I also have stuff rolling out over there. Uh, 
I think next week is when we're going to have our travel log, which is uh, I was just stopping random people and talking to them on the street. Um, I'm really excited for that. Like that, that like that should be rolling out there. Yeah. Um, very excited about that. I also have a. I think when it, when does this go up? Like when uh, is this pod? I mean, we're live on Twitch right now, so that adds yeah. a wrinkle. But. It'll it'll probably hit podcast feeds uh, tonight, like in the cloak of darkness, and then it will get like shared out tomorrow probably let me let me double check i feel like this sgf was the sgf of embargoes more than any other sgf that i've Mm. been to which granted i've only been to one but i had e3 and stuff before that and i never remember this many embargoes for e3 or anything like that yeah so i'm just quickly double checking something of course of course Uh, so it is embargoed until tomorrow morning what i played hands-on and then interviewed the creative director of so I will just say that it was a video game that was in the Xbox showcase. I did so at Xbox. I can say that much. Okay. But um, it was a very good conversation. Uh, sometimes you never know. This was an appointment that I kind of took just, you know, because they were like they were offering a 30 minute audio interview and I was trying mm-hmm. to do audio interviews. So I was like, uh, even though it's a little like RPG adjacent, you know, I'm kind of like maybe we end up having a good chat. Not only was I very surprised by how good the chat was. Excellent guest, excellent answers, really thoughtful discussion that was really, really interesting. Uh, but the game was surprisingly interesting as well. Yeah. Uh, had a really good time, all things considered. So that'll probably roll out sometime this week. Uh, and then I have another one, which I can say is SteamWorld Heist 2. We have oh, yeah. impressions of SteamWorld Heist 2, plus an audio interview with one of the leads over there that will roll out, roll out later in the month. Um, and then at some point, I will also have another one that is not even about a video game. Uh, is video game related though? I will tease that. Okay. Uh, that's another audio interview and impressions that one John Carson helped me out with. Nice. Uh, he will appear on that prominently. So I did a lot of just weird, random, different stuff. And that was kind of the interesting part of SGF was like, I felt like I was approaching it in a different way than I usually do. Yeah. Usually I'm very like, I got to run everywhere. I got to do all my appointments. I got to uh, sit down. I got to write. I got to blog really fast and then get ready for the next one. This time, because the fact that I was primarily there for Blood God content and I was working on audio stuff and a lot of my stuff was also embargoed, I got to like breathe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I also got to spend time like just seeing people drift around that space and kind of see how people were reacting to SGF, if that makes sense. Um, And so I found it kind of an interesting event because of that. Uh, So I have a lot of thoughts about how SGF sits in our modern industry landscape as it were yeah. um, i think a lot of people coming out of this weekend were talking a lot about like okay this is what year two year three of sgf uh so what does it mean especially now that e3 is like dead dead yeah. like like gone gone <laughs> i know i'm actually because you I, I know you've been to e3 Eric. you can you've also been to e3 right mm-hmm. yeah we've uh, been to an yeah. e3 together we should we should probably cool. get into that mm-hmm. a little bit just kind of the your experience at at both and and kind of oh, sure. what you're thinking of with the future of you know how this how sgf is net now just that like it has become e3 because there is no e3 mm-hmm. um but before we hop into that, uh, this intro is wild because I didn't even say the name of the podcast, who I am, any of that stuff. So, <laughs> of course, as always, I'm your host, Brennan Groom, and you are listening to the Past Controller Podcast. Uh, that is not how the normal intro goes, but if you're here, you already know this is a special episode. So my, why not make a special intro? So we're before we get right into it... Um, I'll do just a couple of quick housekeeping. Actually, we'll just do one housekeeping thing. The PTC Movie Club for uh, June is Mike's pick, and it is Godzilla Minus One. So if you want to listen to us chat about Godzilla Minus One at the end of the month, make sure you watch that. It is available on Netflix now, where you can buy it, stream it, rent it, or whatever other nonsense you do. Ken made a face. Did you not know it was on Netflix? Well, I did, but I was also going to make a request for y'all to maybe cover a movie down the line. To make you cover a movie? No, for, for like, no, for like for your your movie club. Like, can I like pitch a movie for you? Uh, we have. Or that, that's that's all on you. That's y'all. So, like so, y'all like go in like a circle. So budget, right? yeah, we, we okay. do. But I will say this: okay. sometimes we will do double features, mm. so you could sneak in as a double feature. Is it like okay. a topical to a certain thing, or you just specifically want us to watch a movie? Uh, it just came out. Okay. If I saw the TV, though. Is it out, like, 
for home no, it's on vod it's on vod now right yeah. through like okay. amazon or something anywhere anywhere okay. Any, anywhere you can buy vod for um oh. my only request is that you would have to come on for that episode too okay okay oh, yeah. all right well we'll we'll figure out the Played details right on into that. his hand there brand that's bad <laughs> negotiation listen i the, the whole premise of the movie club kind of was born out of the fact that i don't watch movies so then it kind of turned into oh, like, like jesse yeah like jesse yes um mm-hmm. Which is funny because Jesse and I kind of have the same opinion. I think most movies are also too fucking long. Not to Jesse's extent. Jesse's 45-minute stance is a little aggressive uh, in my opinion. But I I appreciate the movie club because it has made me watch a lot of things that I otherwise probably never would have watched. And a lot of stuff that like I've really enjoyed. There's been some real weird picks on purpose um, that have not been great to watch. But like a lot of just great movies that... I've never mm. seen before that have really. Uh... What if y'all watched all ten Saw movies? Uh, I mean, listen, that that's something that like Dom would probably suggest, and I don't want you to tell him that because I don't want to do that. Dom does pick a lot of horror from time to time. Like we've watched mm. Creep. Um, Todd also picks horror sometimes because Todd loves horror. So like we've watched uh, Hereditary. We watched. Mm. The movie, oh fuck, what the fuck is it called? Um, it came out two years ago, I think. It was like, uh, it had, crap. It was like a movie that people really liked. It was like a one-word title. Mm-hmm. Bear? No. Um, what was it about? I'm trying to think of how to like describe it or even name any actor in it. There was a well-known actor at the beginning, but they are not in the movie long. Um, and I scream. N- no, I can't, I'm I am so bad with movies. I'm so bad with actors. You're getting, you're getting further now. He, he was the he was like the lead in Looper. If either of you saw Looper. Oh, uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Yes, Joseph yeah. Gordon Levitt. I couldn't think of his name. Uh, he is in that film for a brief period of time. I, I'm sitting it from my computer. I could very easily look this up, and I'm choosing not to. I'm working on it. Um, I'm assuming it's not Don John, right? No, no, it's a horror. It's a horror movie. Um, hey, look. <laughs> I yeah, I guess I watched Don John, and that did frighten me <laughs> multiple times. I saw. Uh, here's some some lore for me. Uh, I saw Don John in theaters in the like an hour after I got my first tattoo, and in in, in the midst of my first ever gallbladder attack. So like I was in pain in the midst of that entire film for nothing to do with what was on screen. But my arm was killing me. My gallbladder was literally trying to kill me. Uh, and then that was happening on, on the screen in front of me. It was a horror movie, single word title I'm with pretty Joseph sure. Gordon-Levitt in it. Yeah. He's not in it long though, which is, I guess maybe kind of a spoiler for the movie. Um, I'm, tr- I'm just trying to look it up now. I'm also going to point out that, Despite what people say, Saw is not a horror movie. It is a death game movie. I have seen some of the Saw films. I'm just, so I throw all uncomfortable watching things into that bucket because I don't like feeling uncomfortable in that way. Like, I don't like blood. I don't like uh, gore. And I obviously, like, I don't like jump scares and shit. You don't like, um, like torture stuff. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Are you seriously about to call Saw torture stuff in the middle of a podcast? We are on there, Twitch. There we is, have so much to get to. We have other things to be talking about. Stuff. You're about to start. You're about to make me fucking have this fight in the in the middle of a Twitch stream. Ken, Eric, Barbarian. I have is not the seen the film. Barbarian. There we go. Mm. There, there is a scene in one of the two Saw movies I have seen where a dude slowly gets his limbs twisted and torn off. It's a death game. If that's not torture, then I don't know what is. It's a death game. Well, yeah, they die at the end of it. So, <laughs> well, yeah. like I'm saying, like, it, like Hostel is a torture porn film where, like, you were literally just watching people get. No, I did not up. call it torture porn. It's not torture, but I'm saying like <laughs> it is torture adjacent, and people might have trouble watching. The same reason they might have trouble watching 24, a show that is not explicitly. Well, it, it is pretty explicitly about torture in some scenes because it it does have violent depictions of torture. Uh, watching people go through extreme pain and duress is what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's torture porn. That's a different thing. So like just to give you an example of my like preferences, Ken, like we watched a while ago prisoners. Have either of you ever seen that movie with, uh, I think I've heard of it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Jake Gyllenhaal, Jake Gyllenhaal and Hugh Jackman. Mm -hmm. 
and mm, like okay. it's not a scary movie. It's not even that gory. There is some intense violence, um, but it's like the basic premise is like some neighborhood kids get kidnapped, and one of the, the kids is like Hugh Jackman's kid, mm-hmm. and it, it's like it's a, just a very extremely uncomfortable thing to watch. And I'm just like I, I don't know why anyone wants uh, to watch this for two and a half hours. Saving Private Ryan. There's that scene when they're having the firefight at the end, and the dude is like pushing the knife slowly into the guy's chest. I can never watch that scene. I always skip mm. it. Um, I usually end up skipping a lot of Saving Private Ryan because while I find other war movies kind of do, they'll have a lot of like the realities of war in them. There's something about some of the scenes in Saving Private Ryan that make me like very deeply uncomfortable, and so that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. So that maybe maybe torture is not right, but just like extreme gratuitous like duress and pain Mm -hmm. and stuff like that uh is is tough to watch for some people yeah uh like last year we watched the witch which is also like very uh, evocative of some of those like uncomfortable themes that i would normally a lot not like but i did i I would like to watch i i did enjoy the film i'd like to watch that movie at one point because i i do i'm aware of the ending and like the general idea of it and that intrigues me but Mm -hmm. Uh, I also worry I would definitely have nightmares. So yeah, yeah, I whenever we have a film that is something that I don't think I'll enjoy, I usually watch it during the day. <laughs> so, uh, or even break it up. Like I'll watch half of it and then like take a break and then come back to it because I just, anyways. Uh, so yeah, we'll talk about Godzilla minus one at the end of the month, and maybe we'll have Ken on soon to talk about. Uh, TV and TV glow, the glow of the. I saw the TV glow. I saw the TV glow. Okay, uh, I've seen you and now like eight other people in our like mm-hmm. rotating group of friends that have now posted about that film. So is that you spreading the good word or people? It's just a good movie and people are all watching it. I think a lot of people, have probably a little bit of both. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Yeah. I will. So one of the things we do as well, if we remember is when we pitch the next movie, because again, I just know nothing about movies. Usually they'll ask me to say what I think the movie is about because I normally don't know what the fuck's going on with that film. I know nothing about it. So if we do it, I will, I will also give my beforehand. Mm -hmm. What do I think that's about? Because I don't know what the fuck it's about. (laughs) Um, anyways, so yeah, uh, that's housekeeping. We'll move right on. So I guess we'll start off with, the two of you, uh, you know, kind of comparing and looking forward ahead of what E3 was for you, what SGF is for you now. And, and you know, it can be as little or long of an answer you want it to be. I think the the thing I kept thinking about this weekend, this last weekend, and then I kind of posed as a question to some people was... <clears throat> are we remaking E3 in the aggregate? Like, are we have dispensed of E3, well, and, and, you know, like, E3 dispensed of itself in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, like, E3 has largely gone the way of the Dodo uh, due to a variety of reasons, and a lot of people seem pretty happy for it to be gone, and and I understand why. Like, it was a lot of money, first of all. It was a yeah. big spend, um, especially for the people showcasing stuff there, but even for... Uh, people going to it, um, but p- put a pin in that. Uh, it was a big, gaudy thing uh, that was often very difficult to work. You had to spend a lot of time in the LA Convention Center running around it, going from appointment to appointment. Booths were gigantic. They were huge. And even though it wasn't until the later years that the public was allowed to enter, there was always like ways for people who could theoretically prove themselves to be somewhat games industry adjacent to get a pass in. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so you would still have massive crowds, just giant crowds. Uh, Maybe not like packs on the biggest pack stay crowds, but not too far off from it. Um, And they would all kind of be moving. I think that was always the strangest part to me is why does E3 have lines, you know, Mm, and and that that's ultimately the the case because theoretically if you're doing e3 the way that we did e3 you were taking appointments you were showing up checking in and if everyone was doing that then there would never be a line so lines were kind of symptomatic of like there are a lot of people here who are entering in a different way and creating like congestion around these booths and it becomes more of you know not a theme park but like not dissimilar from a theme park 
So that's gone. Now what we have is Summer Game Fest. And if if you out there listening to this pod don't know, because I actually think it's weird that we don't talk about the specifics of what it is. I do think there are travel logs and stuff that can kind of give you an idea of what this looks like. Basically, I don't know if we're allowed to, I don't think we disclose the location or anything, but um, SGF takes place at this event venue that is in the, the like the fashion district is is in la but is in a different place than the la convention center and all that um it is smaller smaller scale uh much more rigorous in terms of how you know who's allowed in who can get in most stuff is done by appointment there are this year there were a couple people who were like oh we will have it like a walk-up station I think that was a response to the fact that this year you could get an industry pass. Uh, mm-hmm. There was like the ability to buy a day pass as an industry person. Um, but broadly, it's a, it's much smaller scale. Fewer people are there. Uh, they have a lot of good amenities, which are really nice because, you know, LA Convention Center meant that you had to either eat convention center food, wait for a food truck or go, you know, off and go to one of like the very tourist attraction food places nearby all of which was either expensive or time consuming or unhealthy uh in the case of the the convention food i'm sorry but like the convention center food was was not healthy for you the nice thing about sgf was they provide a lot of great stuff you have like coffee and water and all that nearby easy to get easy to pick up and go uh a lot of good food they did a good job at food selection this year i thought i know this is something that you know person at home maybe doesn't really care about but the thing i'm leading to is that it's smaller and more focused on presenting an optimal experience for this select group of media and content creators to experience games in the best setting possible which is a very good thing Mm -hmm. i think that's great here's the twist here's the wrinkle number one it's scattered all out over la yes uh Xbox was on an island out in the middle of west la uh so the day that they did their stuff you pretty much had to go out there and never come back until you're done with all your Xbox stuff because it was a drive out and back. Uh, I know someone who did go uh, from Xbox to Playdays and then back to Xbox, and they were like, Oof. "That was that was incredibly expensive." Yeah. Who was that? Um, um, I don't. I don't want to say their name. I don't want to out. Them. Like, who, who <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll, talk, we'll talk about it later. Uh, don't out them on the podcast. I can't even imagine doubling down um, on that on one day because when I left to go to Ubisoft and come back, which was only like I don't know, maybe a seven minute Uber, but it still was yeah, like that was like gotta that was wait like five for the minutes. Uber, gotta go there, do the thing, gotta wait. For I know the people Uber, who like, walked to Ubisoft and came back. Yeah, that's a I, risky move. I, but pro- they did it. I probably should have, to be honest, because my Uber there, mm-hmm. uh, someone almost hit us, and then shortly after that, they almost hit someone, and I was like. I'm already late for my appointment because this mm-hmm. Uber was late, and now all this is happening, and I'm running in there like sweating, like what the fuck just happened to me? And of course, it's like the only time that I Ubered somewhere alone was mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Anyways. So all so so SGF, the actual SGF is in one place, but now now especially that E3 is dead, other companies started to move in and be like, we want to do our own thing. IGN had their thing going. Ubisoft expanded out to be three days instead of one day. Uh, Xbox had their own thing, and they were like, we still lay claim to Sunday and all that. Um, it was very packed and and hectic in a way that I, I think was noticeable. Uh, a lot of people were having to make choices about, like, I'm going to be here on this day, and then on this other day, I'm going to be here for a certain amount of time and then go to the other place and then maybe come back. Um, planning like like adds a layer of logistics that did not exist when everybody was inside the LA Convention Center, right? Like that's the upside of the Convention Center is you're not having to literally get in an Uber and go somewhere else, mm-hmm. uh, which then meant that a lot of people were having to make choices about what they were going to do with what they were going to see. Um, <laughs> the weirder thing about SGF is that it felt like it got denser this year. Like there was more stuff there, but it meant that it was like a more compact zone. Like I noticed there was less uh, table space around that that cafe and stuff like that. A lot more people were drifting towards that food court area, uh, which was kind of, it was kind of off into the corner. Um, I had trouble finding it one day that first day. Um, which is all to say, it feels like it's already starting to outgrow 
the space that it's in. Mm-hmm. And at that point, if it's starting to outgrow the space that it's in, the next best place for it to go would be the LA Convention Center. Because guess what? All the hotels that we had, you know, in the SGF block were around the LA Convention Center. A lot of stuff that people were doing was still centrally located around the LA Convention Center. The JW was still by the Convention Center. Like everything still kind of felt like it was like, like there was a there was a dead whale carcass. And we were all vultures still hanging around the carcass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Do we eventually get to the point that we decide? Let, let's say Jeff Keeley says, okay, IGN Live, you're going to try and hone in on my territory, do my thing, but make it a fan event. I'm going to make SGF a fan event too. And then he's never going to fit fans into that SGF place like it it can't accommodate that many so he's got to go somewhere bigger and guess where he has to go to get a larger event space he's either going to the convention center or he's going somewhere near the convention center like the the novo where ea play used to be and stuff like that so uh all this is to say i feel like we are hitting a point where sgf has to either determine that it's only going to be as big as it was this year and never expand too much further or it's going to have to basically become (coughs) <coughs> sorry it's, <fine. laughs> it's going to have to basically become e3 again yeah uh and i don't know what that answer is because i don't think that remaking e3 is a great idea but i also don't think that like having this continued expansion of just little dotted events all over la that we all have to travel to and from is a great idea either so yeah i wonder if there's another block in that vicinity that it can expand into and essentially just be like a two block thing that is kind of handled the same way where it's like there's you know you need you need your badge to enter and it's not mm-hmm. just going to be people sneaking in and stuff um because that, that's attending my first sgf now my i think one of my favorite things about it was that it was mostly outdoors like there was so much just like outdoor it's like very like you're in those convention centers all day for any other event and it's like it's a lot it takes so much out of you you're breathing everyone's air it's just it's so stuffy and this was just like we could sit outside, drink a coffee, have a devolver margarita, whatever it may be, and just like enjoy each other's company in that space without like leaving the space, which I thought was like a very comfortable way to to do the things we had to do while also being able to kind of enjoy ourselves a little bit. Um, do you have any other things to add on that, Ken, with the just kind of the, the two events and yeah, I mean, it is, I mean, having been to both, like, the relative, I guess, restraint of SGF, at least in the, the Blade's area, is nice. Um, but, yeah, like, because that's the thing is, like, technically, like, some of the stuff that we're going to is not under Keeley's umbrella, because, like, that's why it's all spread around, because, like, no, they're not working with Jeff Keeley and his crew, because they are essentially hosting their own event. They're just kind of doing it out of convenience in terms of, like, time and proximity. Yeah. Um. And so, like, I don't know what... Because I, I assume that Jeff Keighley has had conversations with this company about, like, trying to roll all of it together. And if that those are not coming together, then that's that's that. That's, you know, that's on them. But ultimately, it doesn't mean that we end up traveling all around Los Angeles, one of the most nightmarish cities I've ever had to fucking be in. Um, I'm, I'm so New York-pilled now, y'all. It's, it's fucked up. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's... Ultimately, like, the problems we have with it are not our responsibility to fix, and yeah. it's going to be on individuals in different positions of power to fix those. And it's from... Because, like, even before E3 shut down, like, a lot of companies were trying to, like, spin off into their own thing. EA had EA Play. Um, Ubisoft has Ubisoft Forwards and said Sony doesn't even show up to these things anymore. Well, yeah. granted, okay, to be clear, they were at Play Days. Sony year, was like, there they... this year with the Strangest booth set up where it basically was like they had a back corner with like a security guard and stuff, and they were just like, yeah, we got games over here. <laughs> yeah. Were either of you um, able to play Sony stuff or not? Yeah. No. Okay. That was not in my schedule. Um, but yeah, so like there, there's a lot of like backdoor corporate infighting that is the reason that this is the way that it is. And I don't see those all that changing anytime soon. Because like ultimately, like, w- we complain about how inconvenient it is, but it is ultimately like w- we do it because it, it is our job and it is of service to our listeners, readers, etc. For us yeah. to go see these things, even if we have to take a, two more Ubers in one day to get there. I wonder if 
which I, I don't think it ever would, but if it ever left LA and went to somewhere that was just more convenient, New York, New York, New I mean, York, hey, walkable that's city, e- that's walkable city, public transit that doesn't suck ass. I would wonder where they'd put it in New York. Would they put um, it in Manhattan or they, they go to one of the boroughs? Probably one of the convention centers. I say one of the boroughs like Manhattan's not a bureau. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not a New Yorker. I'm just like I think of Manhattan and then I think of like, you know, the other boroughs. Man- so. Manhattan is a borough to be either. I know, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Just how how my mind perceives it as a non New Yorker. Um mm. but yeah, well, I mean it has Well you, you can fix that by being a New Yorker. No, I'm good. Uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, we've all had, I imagine, some similar thought about like what would an event look like in our city because obviously, like Austin hosted hosts uh, South by Southwest every year, and I've always wondered why like Pack South was in San Antonio instead of Austin and all that kind of stuff. But the again comes back to like what does you know what does Jeff at all want you know like this to be, um, and you know Los Angeles for all its failings does make some sense for some of the companies that are there Mm -hmm. um ign hosting ign live made a ton of sense because if they're going to move basically the entire company out to their la offices for a week anyways why not rent out a giant event space and just host a war room on floor two and then on floor one host a fan event that people can buy tickets to and wander around play some demos and play games we went to it uh for a brief moment Mm -hmm. uh, and it seemed like it was all right i mean i i don't know if i would have gone for all three days if, yeah. if I was like local or whatever and I was just a fan um, but I maybe would have picked like one day that had the stuff that I wanted to see in person and then kind of wandered and stuff and I would have been pretty okay with it uh, and and it seems like they got a pretty you know lukewarm reception you know they were like yeah that, that was cool and we want to do more with it and think about how to do more with it so uh, that is an interesting wrinkle and in all this is here's IGN saying like we're going to do the fan event part that E3 like tried to merge into the industry part. So theoretically these two things could stay separate. Yeah. If all parties involved are cool with them staying separate, but still occupying the same space. And that's what my curious, that's where my curiosity goes is like, is Jeff okay with sharing the space is IGN. Okay. with sharing the space Would IGN start to try and poach some of the big stuff that Jeff wants to reveal and show at his show or vice versa. Would Jeff want to start trying to get, more crowds and more people in you never know does it create competition probably we're probably going to see some competition between those two entities as well as like yeah ubisoft shows stuff out you know at at sgf but they do hold stuff back for their own event Mm -hmm. so do other companies now see the opportunity to go like hey well if prices at the sgf campus get a little bit too much you know maybe we start looking at, at our own stuff to host there were plenty of companies that hosted offsite events that weren't even at any of the places that we mentioned. They just did their own offsite event somewhere else or like somewhere around it. Or there was a company that was like, Hey, just come to our studios that are here, you know, before or after SGF and play something there. Instead, we know you're going to be in town anyways. So just extend your trip by a day. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens like that. There's a lot of like benefit to it being so centrally located and having that week that people know that like media is going to be in town, but then it's like, how do you piecemeal it out? How do you figure out how to make the best use of it? And then how does it feel equitable? That's the other part Mm -hmm. that I get concerned about. Um, there was this conversation last year, uh, about sites getting access. Um, and I think this year I maybe gained a greater respect uh, first person uh, than I did previously because attending under acts of the blood God, uh, you know, we're, we're a pretty decently sized podcast, but it certainly doesn't have the weight that I could throw around if I used one of my other bylines or something like that. And so there were definitely doors that I had to push a little harder to get through uh, than normal. And I was talking to people who run their own smaller sites or freelance for other sites. And it was like, yeah, that's what they deal with more mm-hmm. often because when you have the big byline, it's easier to open those doors. When you don't, it's harder to open those doors. And it makes me concerned about how equitable we're making these situations, especially if we do slim down and concentrate into one weekend and into one small event venue. How do we make sure that everybody's getting a shot at covering something? I don't know. Ultimately, that's on the PR and the publishers because they are the ones who are saying, you know, like, check, yes, you can, you can come in and sit and watch our presentation and play our game. Um, 
and and getting in the door this year i think was easier for most people um i was able to get an invite to sgf pretty easily uh granted like i'm a connected person and and that helped but like uh it was getting the appointments where some of the rubber hit the road and i would be concerned i would be curious to see how publishers react in the future to making it more equitable to allow more smaller outlets smaller writers to have the same hands-on opportunities and not get filled up with like okay well we've got a bunch of people here from x site that are all taking up seats and stuff like that yeah i feel conscious about that when i was doing that at other websites it was like i'm bringing in a plus one or something and i'm like does that plus one now take a seat away from somebody else that could have had it like that's something to think about so yeah yeah. for sure uh i mean we we dealt with similar things i mean we i got access you know, rather late to the game, I would say, compared to other folks um, getting into SGF. And then it was the same thing of just getting those appointments. Some of those things, it's like, oh, I have relationships with people. So things were, you know, a little bit easier to obtain. But there were some things that, you know, I, I think Ken can also feel that that fire a little bit, too. There were certain things that I think we all wanted to to yeah. see that maybe took a little bit extra or maybe some other things to to make happen. So um it, it's yeah. it's an interesting thing to see evolve over time i it seems like to me from the people up you know, from this conversation and from other people i talked to at sgf and and afterwards of it seems like it has already gotten better from previous years so hopefully that trend continues um because you know it, it is it is hard for the smaller creators for the independent creators to to get into some of those spaces so We'll see. Um, but I guess we can pivot over to, I guess, just some of the, our favorite things that we had a chance to, to play that we can talk about. Um, Ken, why don't you go first? Um, I would say, am I, I going to give my Sonic X Shadow Game of the Year or, or Game of the Show game a spiel here? Whoa. Uh, well, I mean, hey, listen. I mean, no, game of the Show. I mean, whatever. I didn't play um, Sonic. Yeah, Eric, did you play Sonic? <laughs> No, I did not. So you can Sonic. you can be the Sonic champion. No, I mean like I say that half of the joke, but also like it, it's a little serious. I mean, main, mainly because I'm I'm a sicko, but just like uh, that was one of the two like games that I came away like really excited about. Um, whether whether it was to play them or just to like watch them unfold is you know d- depending on which game I'm talking about. But um, that was a surprising. Uh, Game because like I played Sonic Generations when it came out in 2011, and you know it, it is what it is. It's kind of like a sort of tribute anniversary game mm-hmm. towards a, uh, a, a an entire series, just like remaking old levels and shit. Um, so to see that treatment given to Shadow and his like frankly short lived legacy within that franchise, because Sonic as a franchise has been kind of hesitant to acknowledge how many people actually gave a shit about that guy yeah. for. Uh, for like a, you know a, a good like five year span of this franchise history yeah um so to be able to play some of his old levels in that new style was actually like really fascinating to see the uh the, the sort of like de- design philosophies of what Sonic generations is uh brought uh, made even more modern because uh it's um you know it's, it's obviously made for like modern hardware so it's there's shit that happens in shadows levels that would have broken a 360 back in the generation's days um and so it's just it, it's heartening to see sega leaning into that character this year um and if they're not gonna you know make a whole new game like it, like going back to generations and going into that well and framing that idea around him is very cool um played that game three times across the entire <laughs> sgf which was more than i played anything else um, so I shout mean, out to the people. Or, shout out to the people <laughs> running that booth for letting me do that. I was um, in that booth for one of the other appointments, and you, I watched you go back multiple times to play it. Got to, got to get your fix. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a sicko that was sick at LA. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think the the most like impactful game I've been thinking about has been Dragon Age. Um, mm-hmm. Which I saw. Uh, I mean, the, the the footage that the twenty minutes of footage that's out now is like a chunk of the demo that they were presenting there. Okay, it was um, hands and off, just, right? For that, it was hands off. Okay. It was off. Um, and that game is just been interesting to think about because I think it is. And in like, if, if you go like the the 
darkest corners of the Bioware fandom on the internet. Like, you see, like, it is already causing a lot of infighting, I guess. But it's also been, like, a really interesting, like, kind of, like, resurgence of that studio's fandom. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, it it really puts hard into, like, an action game. Like, like the uh, the class that they've been showing is the rogue. And that is, like, the most action-oriented sort of, like, character action game sort of, you know, melee combat, a lot of dodging, a lot of timing a lot of uh you know just just very like the, you know the next step up from dragon age 2 so it's been i think a bit of whiplash for a lot of people to have waited 10 years for that game and it be not what they've probably what they might have been imagining mm-hmm. for all this time um but i am even if like and you can go listen to our 50 fucking episodes of normandy fm where we talked about this entire franchise <laughs> um i am largely disenfranchised with dragon age despite my, my Dragon Age husband being in the background of this shot. Um, Wait, but I you, did like. Have you guys done Normandy on all of the Dragon Age games? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I didn't know was, you did all of them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the second Every series we did, Asher Mask. Yeah. Oh. 50 episodes. Or 49, I think, actually. Sounds it, right. Yeah. Some, something like that. Uh, and um, so I'm largely disenfranchised from that series, but it did, like, I, I got in my feelings a bit, just being like, oh, Bioware's getting to make a, a game that's not fucking Anthem. Yeah, a game that is not the open world glo- bloat of Inquisition and Andromeda, um, and so like I'm, I'm I'm interested to see how that game shakes out. I think there are going to be a lot of people angry. It's not Dragon Age Origins again, but Dragon Age hasn't been that in 15 years. And uh, to me, I am just kind of eager to see that story wrapped up and then meet these new characters that they're showing off. Well, I'm excited for you. Maybe, maybe this will be where I dip my feet into Dragon Age. We'll see. Start with Inquisition. If you're if you're like if you're not gonna play the whole thing, do not play Veilguard before playing Inquisition. Okay. All right. Noted. I think that's also what uh, Eric and Nadia said to me on Blood God. So mm-hmm. I will. I will. He. I own Inquisition. It is. It is on my shelf. I've just never played it. So, or I may have started it and then like didn't play more of it. But, um. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about you, Eric? Some of your standouts from from play days. Sadly, I can't talk about one of them. Well, like I said, I can say what it is. It was SteamWorld Heist Two, and and I, I will say that like the thing I can say, I'm not allowed to get into gameplay or specifics or anything. I'm allowed to like broadly mention that I played it and what my impressions were on podcast. So I will say this: I sat down for like an hour long appointment. And when they came to get me to take me off of said appointment to go to the interview, I I felt like I got highway hypnosed. Like like I thought I I had time just pass like that, where I just like blacked out and and was in the the heist land. And you can hear more about that later. Yeah. Uh, but that's, two, I can't. That's gonna be like one of I think like a a very very uh, strong little kind of tease for that though. Like that that's I not I, a lot of games yeah. will do that. Because there was, mm-hmm. there was probably at least one thing that I played where I kept looking at my watch, like, how much longer do I have to play this game? Mm-hmm. And and some games don't <laughs> demo well. Yeah, I exactly. Feel bad exactly. About. There are definitely games that I played this weekend that I really liked, but I was like, this is not the format I want to play them in. Phoenix Springs was that way, where I was like, I love the concept of what is what is happening here. I love everything about this. I just want to play this at home on my own computer and not like in the middle of a show floor. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of how like I, I was not getting lost in it the way I wanted to get lost in it. That's kind of how I felt about Kanitsugami. Like I, I think mm-hmm. I actually am going to like that game, but I just, it, I don't even know the demo was bad. I just don't think I was in the right, like space for it, that to the, be my, it takes what I was a while doing. to get going to. Yeah. I did like Kanitsugami, but I felt like it took a while to get to the point and get to like, Oh, the, because it started like basically at the beginning yeah. and it was like, here's all your mechanics one by one. And I almost wish I had gotten like a middle slice of that game mm-hmm. and not like a beginning slice of that game. Uh, two games I can talk about that I did really, really like, though. Um, number one, Metaphor Refantasio, uh, which should not really surprise anybody. Um, that game is quite excellent. Uh, we got to go hands on with three different sections of it. Uh, the first was kind of the close to the beginning of the game little bit more of a story driven section light dungeon crawling and stuff like that's where they kind of introduce you to all the different mechanics that you have uh like i said 
the the major thing because you will you'll start playing it and you'll be like wow this is really persona 5 like the protagonist even does when he starts running he does the little like come on let's go thing that joker does <laughs> in p5 and i was like yep that's that's that all right um but you can do kind of a sword attack and a dodge roll in the overworld and you can use that to beat up enemies that are way lower level than you and you basically just win the fight you like, like hit them three times and they go poof like a muso and and you get all your rewards and xp and stuff like that you don't go through the menus you don't do turn-based battle at all i think that's brilliant i yes. think that's so smart and then when you get to a higher level enemy you can try to go for the attacks and then if you stagger them kind of you get the thing that's like squad strike and then you hit the button and you get the cut in of somebody's face going like ah <laughs> like persona uh and then everybody jumps in and you get like the the free turn basically and uh it, it works really really well i think it's a smart way of updating that game's combat everything else is very familiar you know weapon types and, and magic types weaknesses that you target to try and get extra turns on your resource economy stuff um a lot of it will feel very familiar i didn't get a great sense for how the the archetype stuff works you have like different job classes and they have their own abilities mm -hmm. but then they can also uh synthesize and, and and synergize with other job classes to like do tandem attacks and dual attacks i didn't get a sense for what was like limiting those or why you would want to use them or not use them if there was like a limited resource that i was like dipping into or what um all that is to say that game is gorgeous that game's got a really interesting story cooking I kind of went in expecting it to be good and came out like, yeah, that met my expectations. So that was that was really good. Um, the one I think that surprised me and then I want to shout out UFO 50. Mm. I love UFO 50 so much. I'm enamored by UFO 50. Uh, it is basically a game from Day of the Devs uh, that is made by Moss Mouth, the developers of Spelunky and various other friends. Uh, the idea is is a compilation of a fictional video game console that never never existed called you know from a company called ufo soft um it takes place from like the early 80s to the 90s in terms of game development and you get to kind of see different games tackle the progression of game you know what you had what you had to work with what kind of pixels you had to work with what kind of tech you had to work with what kind of sound design space you had to work with but with modern design sensibilities applied to those tech limitations all the while like all of these games are wildly inventive you have like a fighting game where you're playing as different samurai showdown-esque characters that are using different abilities to knock uh a wind jammers style disc back and forth you have a uh, a tactics game that's like an auto battler you have a point and click horror game you have a dungeon crawler you have all these different styles of game that are really inventive and interesting that you can just freely access and go through and i just loved going in and out of these games finding stuff to do uh seeing all the different stuff there's tons of like local co-op and local multiplayer that you can get into as well it just seems like such a fun little box of game design that i cannot wait to play it and just get like lost and you know maybe i won't like every game but i'll probably like 5 10 15 of those games mm -hmm. and they're not mini games that's the thing i think is really surprising they're not like tiny little experiences they are games they are video games the size that you would expect if you went and bought like an atari compilation or something like that they're like fully fledged full body games um I'm really excited for it. I, I can't wait for that to come out. So that is definitely like top of my list from SGF. Yeah, that that game looks great. Um, I was looking to see if it was part of Steam Next Fest. If there was a demo, I didn't see one for it. But I don't think there is. Um, that, uh, that building game... relationships does have a demo, mm -hmm. and you should go play that. Yeah, that I did not play. So that I actually am going to download this week because I've heard nothing but uh, mm -hmm. love pouring out for that game. Did you get a chance to play that, Ken? Yeah, okay. uh, very briefly. Um, is it, uh, it, it still seems very silly, but the the writing is very good. Yeah, that was that was in like the ten minutes I got to play. That was my takeaway. Okay, okay, yeah, I'm excited for that one. Um, I'll I'll echo metaphor because metaphor for me was one of the big games. Mm -hmm. I I love Persona Five. Uh, P Five Royal is probably one of my favorite games of all. Um, it is one of my favorite games of all time. I love that game. Um, so 
you know, all of the good stuff about Persona is there in that demo. We got, you know, the amazing just vibes of what that game is, both visually and, you know, music and just all the style that's coming out of that game is there. I'm so, so excited to, like, be in that world. I'm excited that it's in just a very different setting than we get in Persona games where it's just, like, high fantasy. It's just a lot of different stuff going on. I love the party so far. Like, I, my biggest hope is that that party lives up to how cool they look. Like, I hope that I mm. like those party members because they all, to me, look really cool. Um, and I think that was one of the few scenarios where like you eric i went into that with very high expectations and i walked out not feeling like feeling very high leaving that that room so i think that's like not an easy thing for someone to do especially like going in with high expectations so very very much looking forward to to more time with that game when it comes out later this year in october um in that same booth i'm a super monkey ball sicko uh, Super Monkey Ball, uh, but why? It's not Banana Mania. Banana Rumble, yeah, Banana Rumble. Uh, Banana Rumble is Banana Mania was the last game. Uh, Banana Rumble is like if you like Monkey Ball, this is and if you and if you've been soured with Monkey Ball in its recent iterations, this is like a return to form with, I think, some of the better new mechanics that they could add to that to make it a you know, just a a fresher experience, a more modern experience, and tweak some things that I think play better for what that game is as opposed to some of the stuff that they cut out from more recent games. So mm-hmm. looking forward to, to playing more time with that. Like, it has a lot of fun. Like, I played through a lot of the uh, multiplayer modes that were there. They were all very fun, and I think there's a lot of, like, hit or miss with Monkey Ball minigames in certain, uh, you know, versions of that game. And the ones that I played in the demo, at least, I enjoyed them all. So, like, that's that's not the norm for Monkey Ball. There's normally, like, yeah, I like Monkey Target or, like, this or whatever. And it's, like, skip half these mini games. In this, it was like, oh, no, these are all pretty fun. I could see myself, like, having a really good time with friends playing this. So, looking forward to more time with that. Um, one of the other standouts for me was a game called Arranger, a role-puzzling pl- yes. role adventure. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you play it, Ken? Did you, fin- did, did you yeah. finish it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, wait, so I'm a gamer. When, well, when I was playing through it, because Luis came with me to my appointment because Luis had always, already seen it, and yeah. Luis was like secretly hoping I wouldn't finish it because apparently a lot of people didn't complete the demo. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I loved. I adored that game. Like that's a that's a Brendan ass game. Like it's mm. it's a puzzle game. It has amazing art, music, sound design, and it's a unique puzzle game and how you are solving puzzles like the whole world moves on a on a grid that you rotate and it just i think it presents itself in a very digestible way teaching you how to interact with the world and it's not overly tutorialized even though like i think that game could be harder to figure out at first if it didn't like sure. the way that it presented itself i think was very clear i thought i don't it, know if you feel it's the one of those things way. that like it's one of those things that like makes sense the second you see it in motion, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just because like as you're moving and you see the, the the floor moving with you in the direction you're going, you're like, oh okay, I like suddenly yeah the entire like paradigm of how I exist in this world is clear to me exactly. Um, and even when they so, it, like added in like other mechanics where it's like you can hit the edge and like pop on the other side and stuff like mm-hmm. that, like it it just kind of all worked. Like you didn't have to. Yeah. I don't know. That was like one of the points where I. Like even the dev that was there, like mentioned it. Like I was like, oh, I I get this entirely. Like when after you in that demo where you after you finish the boss fight, you have to go through like this kind of like long pathway. And mm-hmm. I was like, the second I moved down, I would just move off to the edge, and then I'd be on the other side. And like yeah. so, like I Already was popping around so so <laughs> fast. He was he was like, oh man, you, you like really figured it out. And I was like, yeah, like it's it clicks you know, it, again. Like it, it's a very like instinctual game yeah. like once you which a lot of the, the best puzzle games are yes um so that was definitely like the vibe i got from it yeah that 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 game is gonna be like as soon as that's out um i'm gonna eat that up i can't wait for that one that's that was really good um hyperlight breaker another fantastic one i played i don't know if either of you had a chance to play hyperlight breaker or not i didn't play uh breaker in no. the show but i do like drifter a yeah. lot uh it, it's 
set in that same world, not the same character. Uh, I think it's a prequel to the story. And it just, it's, I mean, if you played Drifter, it's a top down, you know, sort of Zelda like is like a kind of close comparison where it's like, like OG Zelda, like it doesn't point you in a direction. It kind of just like plops you in the world, figure it out, go whichever way you want. I think you can choose to play the original game in any direction. I don't think you have to go like in in an order. I think you can kind of do it as you please. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas this is single player, or you can play co op. Uh, you know, rogue like where you are dropped into this hub world. You know, having a progression of story. It's still a very light story game, like a uh, like uh, Drifter was. Drifter was like a very like not story removed, but it was like visual storytelling within the world. And then you'd get like very sparse cinematic things that would kind of give you a little bit of like maybe what's going on. And that's kind of what's going on here. Like there's some visual storytelling within the hub world and within the game world. And there's also like these memories that you unlock that you can find in the world that will give you similar types of cutscenes to to break uh drifter where it was like it's giving you some snapshots of like things that happened without dialogue or or you know whatever it's just kind of like you infer what you want to infer from this um but that stuff aside the gameplay was was really good for what i played like it it has uh, a lot of the stuff that you'd expect if you played drifter but it also has a lot of its own things like there's a, a parry that's pretty, I think, useful and kind of mm-hmm. detrimental if you don't figure out how that timing works. Um, that became really beneficial, especially as I... Because that was another one where it sounded like not a lot of people completed the demo. Because the, completing the demo w- meant you had to kill, I think, three mini-bosses to get their keys. And then you could go face the final boss. And the final boss was not easy. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I actually... so. <laughs> Uh, you have five lives before the world resets. So every time you die, you go back to the hub world. You can buy stuff, upgrade your things. But when you go back into the world, it is like incrementally more difficult than it was on your last life. Um, which I don't think it scales up with like your items and stuff. I think it just gets harder each time you die. Like I don't think there's a. Mm. It's tied to your equipment or gear. So you go in, you do this. I fought the boss like four times. I'm on my last life. I get in there. I think I figured it out, like how to how to move around this guy because the second phase of that boss was was not easy, and we double KO'd each other. Yeah. Uh, so it still counted. I still beat it, um, mm-hmm. but then my world had to reset because I I had died. And the way that it works is when you when you lose all of your lives and you have to reset the world, it changes the biomes and some of the enemies. So I, I was like, asked the dev, I was, oh, do you mind if I just go back in? Because I'd like to see what a different biome looks like. And I had the worst possible RNG where I got the same biome again. And he was like, oh. that's not supposed to happen. So we're going to take note of that um, <laughs> really because it's funny. not supposed to do that. But uh, it was really good. Like if you, especially if you like liked, uh, Drifter, I think you'd really like Breaker if you want that change of combat. Like obviously it's a third person over the shoulder action game. Um so it's a little bit different than the original game, but I I really enjoyed my time with it. I think that's going to be be a a big one when it comes out. It's going to launch in early access. Um, I think at some point this year. I don't think they said when, but that's that's on the horizon. Um, I think those were some of my my top games. I will quickly mention because I played it with Ken, and I initially was not going to take an appointment for it. Was uh, Fear of the of the Spotlight? I know you also played that, Ken. Yeah. What did you What are your thoughts on that? That was, it's not that the game didn't demo well, because that's not what I'm saying, but it's like, when you spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes kind of like establishing what what your supernatural twist is in this PS1-ass horror game, <laughs> and then like you reveal it right at the end, and then it's like, okay, you, you go through this hallway and the, the demo's over, it's like, okay, well, now I have to go fucking live the rest of my life until this is out, so that's fun. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I appreciated that it was like a very entry level for me personally, mm-hmm. it was like entry level horror game where I was like, okay, I'm mm-hmm. not, I'm not going to be scared by this, but I am actually intrigued with where, cause it, it does, it kind of like, it's finally sets you up to kind of experience what may be happening. And then it just pulls the rug out. You're like, okay, I guess I'll just go fuck myself. Like what? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what more of that is. Um, and I'll be watching the rest of the Blumhouse stuff from afar, mm-hmm. but that's, that's, that's valid. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think I mean I think those are some of the highlights for me. If if either of you have anything else you want to 
throw out there or champion or mention, uh, we can head towards the sunset. Yeah, I mean, all the Day of the Dev stuff is mm. just excellent. Um, the other games in there, we mentioned Building Relationships, mm. UFO 50, and Phoenix Springs, which is a like investigative detective game where you use like thoughts instead of your inventory, which I thought was really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was also, while waiting, or while you're waiting, uh, a game about games you play while you're waiting that was really, really fun, really enjoyable. Um, and then After Love EP, which was the game that I thought did yes. not demo well in the moment but is one that i'm very interested in playing when it comes out yeah uh, because it is a hard game to get a sense of when you're in a demo situation but i did really like the vibes the music the art the writing uh it's it's essentially a uh kind of point and click adventure game you you are moving with the control stick and all that but it has a lot of the sensibilities of an adventure game uh where you are playing as a musician whose girlfriend has passed away but you are still hearing her voice and so you were trying to like write your after love EP uh, while going through all these different um, days in the life of this musician uh, dealing with loss and grief and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's going to be very good, has a very sad backstory to it. Uh, one of the original creators uh, passed away during development and the team is kind of carrying on in their stead uh, mm-hmm. and trying to deliver the vision as best they can. Uh, I'd say they are nailing it. I say they're doing pretty well. Uh, so I'm really interested to see that uh, come together and and be out there for both, you know, getting that vision finally out there and honoring that memory. And also, uh, it just seems like a really genuine, fun, enjoyable game that has a lot to say. So uh, all the day of the dev stuff this year was really, really good. Like, I, I know I've always said that their selection is pretty good. They usually find some stuff that's really uh, worth highlighting. But this year, I think I, I sent them a message. I was like, this is probably the best uh selection that i've seen out of day of the devs yet like a really incredible lineup of games that uh stood out at at a place like sgf where everything else is big triple a stuff yeah Uh, i loved it yeah i'm I'm excited for that full game to come out because i think that is gonna wreck me and i need a game to just fucking wreck me so uh i didn't mention mention monster hunter wild so i'll just quickly say i think Mm, that that game looks lit that game looks incredible I think it is the absolute like best possible evolution of what that game series has become over the last few iterations. I think it's iterating on uh, worlds the best it can, and I think it's taking some of the best parts of what made Rise on the Switch so good and putting those together in like a fully next gen version of monster hunter i think it's doing a lot of interesting things you're you're fighting the environment in fun ways it is extremely cinematic not that the series wasn't before but it just you know it's has these updated visuals there has a lot of less transitional loading between zones and between things so it just there's a lot of i think uh just amazingness to come from that like it just it visually looks amazing and i think that it is going to play really well just based on some of the new mechanics that they've introduced, some of the things that they were showing off. It was a hands-off thing, so we didn't get to actually play it, but we got to watch them play through a hunt, and I'm excited. Like, normally with a Monster Hunter game, I will play through, like, up through the credit scene, maybe like, to the credits roll, and then maybe I'll do a little bit of the higher-level hunts after or whatever, but I usually bounce off at some point because there's just other things to play, and, you know, that's just what happens for me. This seems like it could be the thing where it's like, oh, it has crossplay from the get go. Oh, uh, everyone's going to be playing it that I know. Oh, it has all of this other stuff that I normally would be aggravated by, or it doesn't have all these other things from a Monster Hunter game that I would normally get aggravated by. Like, it seems like they continue to iterate on the quality of life stuff every time they make a new Monster Hunter game, and it just continues to build towards something that is just more palatable and pleasing and welcoming to to new players like i thought rise was a very welcoming monster hunter game for people who maybe might feel overwhelmed because it is in a lot of ways like mmo light like it's it, it has a lot of that stuff that might push people or scare people from playing an mmo like you know ken this could be your final fantasy 14 it could oh shit that, that makes me play, play it less. <laughs> I, I could, I could see Ken getting into Monster Hunter. I really yeah. could. I mean, you could probably yeah. make, you could probably make a really dapper, dapper man. Mm-hmm. You know, when you put it that way. And some, I did want to. I, I did like start or consider playing 
the last one, and then everyone was kind of like, oh, it's very systems heavy. I don't know how much you're actually going to jive with that. The, I think a lot of oh, what they're doing with Wilds is smoothing out yeah, the systems. Yes. Like, like a lot of stuff they're doing is like, you don't have to spend so much time micromanaging. Mm -hmm. okay, here are my notices. Here, I got to go back to do this. I got to go do this. I got to go accept this. Like they're smoothing a lot of that out to where a lot of it's just go out into the world and hunt monsters yeah. and bring them back. And I think what will be extremely beneficial from the get go is that like, because it's going to have cross play and a lot of us are going to be playing it in our friend group. I think there is just, mm -hmm. will be a lot of like very easy guiding for, for players who may not, like mm -hmm. you know and even like people that i've played and met online that have just played monster hunter with in the past that community always seems pretty like not dickheads like they, they don't seem mm -hmm. like a bad community overall at least the 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 strangers that i've interacted on you know various monster hunter games in the past so you'll, you'll have a lot of support i mean i fully expect jesse the telly friend of the show to be mm -hmm. All in on wilds when it comes out, so uh -huh. you'll you'll Bay have Nakin, you'll yeah. have a bunch of yeah, Alex. Like there'll, there'll be a lot Jesse of people. Bay Nakin are going to go deep on that game for that, sure. That'll be able to kind of guide you through some of the more cumbersome parts. But again, I, like Eric said, I it does seem like they as they continue to do each iteration and this being maybe one of the best so far in terms of smoothing out the stuff that might be overwhelming to some players, especially newcomers. So yeah. um, definitely excited for that, but. If that's all we got, I think that might wrap our thoughts on, on SGF, on Playdays. Um, as we do with every episode, we end with the game. But before we do the game, which will give you both a chance to get on the leaderboard for the year, uh, plug your shit, whatever you want to plug or not plug or whatever you want to do. The floor is, is yours. Ken, why don't you take us first? Uh, I'm on Twitter at ShepardCDR. Read Kotaku. Listen to Normandy FM. What is uh what's one of your latest Kotaku pieces that you you want people to go read right now? Um or just I've something that you're proud almost, of on the site. Wh whatever you want. Either either I've or something almost, recent or, or I keep cutting you off. Either something recent or such something you're proud of and you want them to go read. Doesn't matter. Uh, I have been writing almost exclusively about Dragon Age for the past like week or so, and that's been great for my mental health. <laughs> um no, I'm trying to, like I don't know if anything is specific from all that. Like it's like, oh, you should go read this thing very specifically. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. Just keep an eye on that. Yeah, you've done. Pokemon, like, like, I, I know I've got at least a couple more things. Dragon Age coming out in the next week. <laughs> but you've done like great Pokemon pieces that I I've really enjoyed. Yeah. You've done. Uh, I mean, if you like Last of a Show, Ken has done great stuff about Last of well, Us. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely go check that stuff out. Uh, I'm a fan of your writing, Ken. So like I, I want to I want to plug that. Um, not to say well, I'm not a fan of your writing, Eric. <laughs> just... okay, well, then the fav my favorite thing I've ever written at Kotaku was my Phantom Liberty review. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So definitely go read that if you played Cyberpunk. Uh, what about you, Eric? Uh, you can find my words by day at Destructoid. Uh, you can find my uh, words by night at uh, Acts of the Blood God and Norm DFM. Uh, if you want stuff to specifically go look at, I did a preview of Citizen Sleeper 2 that I thought came mm -hmm. out pretty well. I've always liked writing about those games. And uh, I thought my review of Citizen Sleeper 1 was one of my favorite things I've written for Destructoid in the past. So getting to write about 2 again was really fun. And I don't know if I know what my favorite thing I've ever written for Destructoid is off the top of my head. But the first one that comes to mind is uh, one that I actually wrote somewhat recently amidst all the uh, Microsoft layoffs. Uh, it's a piece called uh, Game Developers Keep Paying the Price. And uh, I was pretty happy with how that one came out. So maybe go check that out and get mad about rich people with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is the is the Blood God charity not? It's in July, just not dated yet. Blood God, Blood God, uh, charity stream for Trans Lifeline will be happening in July. We don't have a date locked in yet, but it will be happening. Brandon Ken will obviously be taking part. I've already enlisted them. They don't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> uh, we will be raising cash once again for Trans Lifeline uh, in the midst of July. We will have dates and important information on that soon. Uh, I, I've just been recovering from SGF, but that planning is about to begin in earnest uh, this week. So look forward to that. Hell yeah. Love to, love to hear it. Love to see it. Definitely go support these two fine people because they do great stuff and they're great friends. Um, 
you can find all the stuff we do if you're listening to this, obviously, at PassController.io. If you're an audio listener, just a friendly reminder, we do record the show live every week. So if you do want to see our faces, you can go to twitch.tv slash PassController and do that. If you can't catch the live show, no problem. Just search Pass the Controller Podcast on YouTube and we'll pop up there. So the way that this game is going to work is... We're going to play something that we call Answer Unlocked, which you have neither of you have been on for. You've been on for What's in the Box. I've not played this. No, this is new. But the way that Answer Unlocked works is I'm going to read the achievement slash trophies for the game. Whoever guesses the game first gets the point. Uh, Because you're both guests, you'll get plopped on the guest leaderboard. And our guests have not fared well this year. There's only one guest on the board. One I'll say now, I have, I have not paid attention to trophies or, or achievements in well over 10 years. <laughs> this is going to even be even better. You'd be surprised how s- sometimes the tr- trophies and achievements have like clever like they have puns, counts. like whatever. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. it's just straight up like if you've played or know this game, you're going to know right away. Um, like I straight up, I have not had the notifications on for <laughs> the past two generations. Oh, okay. It's like. I stopped being interested about that. Uh, like, I, there were a few things I platinum in the PS3 era, but PS4, PS5 could not be bothered. But we'll see. We'll see how this goes. We'll see how this goes. Uh, game number one. Crack. Uh, and I will iterate each time if, if it needs to be said or not. Uh, you do need to give me the full title of this game. So keep in mind, if you say an abbreviated title for this one, you may not get the point. And the person might steal it from you. Crack. Find the crack memory in chapter one. A letter to blank. Find the blank blank memory in chapter one. Officer Fish. Find the business card memory in chapter one. Is this Psychonauts 3? Incorrect. Also not a game. (laughs) Incorrect. Psychonauts 2. Oh, wait, Incorrect. fuck. There is no third Psychonauts. What the fuck am I saying? <laughs> Why did I think there were three Psychonauts? <laughs> because there should be. Because thinking. there should be. Uh, head count. Find the helmet memory in chapter one. Phone. Psychonauts 4. Huh? <laughs> he, he got it. Uh, phone. Find the phone memory in chapter one. Life is strange through colors. It, that is correct. Ken gets the point. Oh my god! Oh. I was sitting here like it can't be true colors. What that wouldn't make? No, I'm stupid. Instead, I went <laughs> Psychonauts three. God, it happens. It happens. All Fucking right. tired. <laughs> Let me pull up game number two. Uh, this game, you don't have to give me the full title. Defier of the Condemnation. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? <laughs> Defier of the Condemnation. Fused with the Proto Fiend blank. <laughs> Def- defender of law ever and always. Recreated the world and upheld God's order. Do you know if we played these games? Is this Doom Eternal? Incorrect. Uh, I don't know actually if either of you have played this game, but I did screen them because I know that you both know this game. So it should be gettable. If it, if we get through and it's too difficult, we can... Shin Megami Tensei 5. Bang. Eric Van Allen gets the point. I was like, where have I heard proto before? <laughs> game number three. You guys are, are, are blowing through these. I should have known what game has God in it. It's always should make out. It, it's, it, it's, it's there. Um, okay. Game number three, the final game. Who is going to walk away uh, as the Normandy FM current leader on the board? The Wrath of Heaven. Progress the story to unlock this achievement. Opposition in all things. Progress the story to unlock this achievement, and I and I will say you do need to give me the full title, which I think okay, you okay. you both will. In your heart shall burn. Dragon Age, Dragon Age Inquisition. Fuck. Ken got it first. 
Ken <laughs> takes the second point that puts Ken tied with Cam at two points on the guest leaderboard. But Eric's God, right there in second damn. place. That also, also was, just happens to be last mm, place. But he's the there. second, the second in your heart shall burn. That it, mm. it was it was so close. It was like almost the same. And I was getting nervous that you were both gonna blur it at the same time. We'd have to just do another game. But I'll uh, tell you now. The the thing that probably gave me an edge there is I actually started re-listening to our Inquisition season just because Dragon Age mood. So like I literally had that in my like I listened to this morning when we were announcing the uh, the PAX online panel that was called In Your Heart Shall Burn, ranking the Dragon mm-hmm. Age companions. So mm-hmm. very front of mind. Ken was prepared. Ken did some homework. He cheated. Damn. It, it, he had the spot. Unbeknownst to me. <laughs> But that'll do it for this week's episode, episode 424. Thank you both to Ken and Eric for coming on, chatting with me about Playdays, SGF, and all the stuff around those events. We appreciate you, and we'll see you next time.